Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the DJ Sessions Presents the Virtual Sessions, where we feature the best DJs, producers, and now industry professionals from around the world. I'm your host, Darren, and right now I'm sitting in the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington, and coming in all the way Pacific Standard Time from LA, we have none other than DJ Colette. Colette, how's it going today? Hey, it's going great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. You know, the last time we caught up was a few months ago, I guess eight months ago. This year is going by so fast, <laughs> by the way. I'm like, I can't believe it's August. And in two months, you know, we're going to be going overseas. We'll be talking about that a little bit later. But August, I think the last time we spoke was in December. Uh, was it right before? I think you and Pete had just dropped the new double compilation. Was that? Yeah, uh, Pete's new album was coming out. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think it was like eight months ago. I yeah, have no, I, I have no concept of time ever. I'm like, it was last week. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I feel with like everything that's been going on so much. And we did, a, we're doing a huge international ramp up of all this um, stuff to get our, our brand out there uh, on a more international level. And we kind of ramped up production or ramped up our outreach by over 300%. That's amazing. Oh, yeah, it's like been just going crazy. It's like interview after interview. And like, oh, who did I talk to last? And yeah. who did I talk to him? So, um, but you know what? I can find out when that interview was because you can go to our <laughs> website and go see O L E T T E and type it in. Boom, guess what? It searches and pops it right up there. Pete Moss and Colette. Oh, it was 22721 was the last wow. oh, gosh, almost a year, over a year ago, I guess it was. So it was before that. Well, it was a good conversation. We were talking about a lot of stuff. Pete's album, The Days, had just come out. And, you know, it was it was a good time. So if you want to go back and watch it again, you can. Absolutely. That's why we archive everything on our website. But thank you for coming on the show today. we got a lot to talk about, a lot to get to. Um, you have been quite busy. And um, just diving right into it, the hot topic that we want to talk about is you have a new record coming out soon. I do. Me I message do. Message in a bottle. Tell us about that journey and, and what is the inspiration behind Message in a Bottle? So I haven't done many covers in my career. Um, I started recording music when I was 16. So, you know, 30 years now of making music. And when I was a kid, I just really loved The Police. I love Sting's writing style. And I was really drawn to this record. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, the original is like, I think, 156 beats per minute. So it's definitely a lot faster <laughs> than I yeah. play. So um, I, I don't know. I just was really, I, I really love that record. And I wanted to do a house rework of it. And um you know, I hadn't been recording in the studio for a while, and um, I just thought it would be a really fun project to do. And and actually, you know, it was it was so much fun, and and it was really challenging though, changing the tempo because I, I think it's one twenty six, mm -hmm. our version, and it was really interesting. You know, you 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 grew up with a song and you sing it all the time, so you know you're used to singing a certain way, and then to make it work for what I'm doing was really different. But uh, and, and, but it's a full record message in a bottle. I mean, obviously, records nowadays, I, I know there's, there's singles, there's EPs, and there's records. Yeah. <laughs> I should know this because we're supposed to be launching a label here next year. <laughs> but, well, this, um, is a, this is a single. It's a cover it is a single. Of, it's a single. Okay. It's a cover of Message in a Bottle. Uh, the first God. mixes are coming out with Pete Moss. Um, okay. You'll be able to hear them. Probably next week on um, SoundCloud and TrackSource, they always do early previews, which I think is cool because then you can kind of see, you can get to hear it right away. And mm -hmm. um, and then more remixes are coming out from Ghetto Blaster and Local Options. I was just talking with DJ Ruby from Malta about an hour and a half ago, and we were talking about the influence that Beatport now has on the on the scene and having a monopoly on that. But he mentioned track source. And he's yeah. like, is it still around? And I actually had to go to the internet in the middle <laughs> of the interview, like, it's still there. <clears throat> yeah. Track source is my jam. I love track source. Um, I have been supporting them forever. You know, I, I also I also dig Beatport and um 
for me, I just have always gravitated more towards track stars. They, I feel, have a little bit more focus on the kind of music that I release and that I play. I still purchase all of my own music that I play. Um, I'm very grateful. A lot of people send me promos and I love it. Please keep sending them. But I like to go out and buy the music. You know, it's not that expensive. And I know um, how important it is to support one another. And, you know, you want people to keep making music, you should go purchase their music. It's like $2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I heard that it's less less than a coffee. Yeah. And I heard that Bandcamp actually has one of the better payouts. Is that correct on the back end of that? I know that somebody put a whole breakdown of what the payouts are per streams or per. I don't remember the exact, but they do. And they also a couple of years ago started doing this thing on Fridays where the artists would get a hundred percent of, um, all of the purchased music. So they do it once in a while. They don't do it as much anymore. They mainly did it during the pandemic to really support artists, which was incredible mm-hmm. because, you know, no one was working and it was just such an amazing gesture for this platform to allow artists to, mm-hmm. you know, also support one another. So everyone had big band camp days, you know, um, on social media, every Friday, people would be like, put up your links, you know, so everyone could really, learn about one another and support each other. And and that's what we have to do, you know, especially being in the underground, you really have to look out for one another. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on NFTs and how they are going to try to change or are they going to change the landscape for music producers? I'm still learning a lot about them. Um, When I first heard about it of course you know it's such an interesting concept and just so so unique that I you know kind of had some trouble wrapping my head around it but I have some friends who have been creating those with their music and they say it's been really fantastic so I haven't completely you know dipped my toe in just yet but I, I you know I'm always open you know the thing is when you make music especially for a long period of time, it's always changing. You know, when when it went initially from playing records to playing CDs, everyone was like, oh my gosh, you know? But that's what it's all about. It's all about <laughs> elevating. And you don't forget where you came from because I mean, I still own all my records and I love my records and I have everything at home. But you want to continue, you know, just adding on. It's always about adding mm-hmm. on. Not taking away, but adding on. Yeah, and, and with the barrier to entry of of DJs now, you know, back in the vinyl days, if somebody only pressed 10,000 or 50,000 copies that went out worldwide, that was it. And that was in your that library and nobody it. else could touch it. And you had the banger, they didn't. Now, somebody puts a, a track on TrackSource, Beatport, or, or Bandcamp, or whatever, out there digitally, and a million people can get access to it. And right. not only a million people getting access, to, I mean, obviously the fans can buy it too, and put it on their their device and listen to it whenever they want to or get it from Apple or whatever. But, you know, that accessibility, you know, do you see that being a detriment to the entry of barrier to DJing or kind of a plus on the barrier to entry of DJing? You know, ultimately, what you individually bring to the table is what makes you a great DJ. Mm -hmm. So 20 years ago, your record collection was a big part of that, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, myself included, got jobs at record stores because that's how you got the records. (laughs) You know, there was like 10 records would come to the city. And if you worked at the store, you got one of them. So part of, you know, what you offered was your record collection. But you still had to have a skill set. You know what I mean? Like, You can have all the best songs, but if you don't really know how to put them together, what are we doing here? You know, like Mm -hmm. anyone can get the ingredients to make a cake. All the cakes aren't going to taste the same. You know what I mean? So I don't really have an issue. I never had an issue even back then. Like I never hid what records I was playing. You know, a lot of people put the white label on top and be like, "Uh, you don't get to know this record. Now there's Shazam. So everyone's like in the corner. They know what you're playing or sometimes they don't. Um, I don't have an issue sharing music. I make music. I want people to have all my music. So I, I've never found that to be a problem. I mean, I really think it's all about perfecting your craft, you know, and what do you bring that's unique to DJing? 
you know, mm-hmm. what do you offer? It's your energy and no one can duplicate that. And was the first record that you ever bought worth mentioning <laughs> or embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> the first record I ever bought was Follow Me. <laughs> follow, follow Me? Wait. Follow Me. Follow Me. It's not ringing a bell. I bet you if I heard it, I'd know it. Oh, no, you know it. I'm not going to sing it, but you know it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to go home later and listen to me like, Ooh. It's one of like the most, you know, famous early house records. So, I mean, the first record I ever had on vinyl though I think I was like eight and it was eight or nine and it was Michael Jackson it was Thriller but my first dance record was Follow Me by Alias yep okay see I got this wonderful thing called the interweb that I can do during a show now oh when you listen to it you're gonna be like oh man (laughs) (laughs) you're like why did I not remember I would totally play it in the show right now, but since I don't have the licensing for it, yeah, YouTube yeah. would shut us down, Facebook would shut us down, <laughs> and Twitch would be like, nope. <laughs> we tried that once before in a show, and I thought we could get away with it, but no, those algorithms out there are just awesome. Yeah. Although I could yeah. put it back up on our site later because we got all that taken care of, but copyright, was, that's a whole other conversation. It was funny. I bought that record because at the time, I think I was 18 when I bought it, and you couldn't get the music any other way unless someone had it on a mixtape. Mm-hmm. And so me just like, you know, loving house music, I wanted to own it. So I started buying records. I was living in a dorm room at the time. And it was really small. And the only place for my, my turntable was under the bunk bed. So I'd have to like lay on the floor and <laughs> put my records on under me. But I would, you know, I'd play it over and over again. I mean, when I loved a record, I mean, I still do that. I'll just play it, you know, seven times in a row. I think, you know, growing up, I didn't necessarily grow up with records. I grew up, my dad had records, you know, and we had eight track. I was a cassette kid generation into the CD generation. Right. And, you know, you could, you could play the tape until it broke. That was kind of the play tape until it broke. But when CDs came out, being able to use that repeat button, Right. And play that right. one track. I would play tracks for three days in a row, just be playing in my background. <laughs> I remember doing that with like Beastie Boys or something I really, really liked. And I just put it on and just play that track. Or you could program, you know, into a CD what tracks you wanted to play and then put that on repeat. Right. You know, and that was kind of a cool thing to do. And that really helped at a lot of parties that I threw. Or the Especially random got, shuffle. Yeah, random shuffle. Or, you know, you could put a bunch of discs in. Because yeah. it would have six discs, yeah. or I think one time we had a hundred disc one. You put all your discs in and just random yeah. shuffles. That was our house party DJ at the time. Because I wasn't into. I had two sets of crowds when I grew up. I had um, I had my local crowd. We didn't listen to hip hop and dance top forty, but then I had the crew that when I came to downtown Seattle and we <laughs> go to a club called the Underground where I first saw Donald Glaude play. Wow. And that changed my whole perspective in 1992. And was like, okay, I love this dance music, this underground yeah. dance vibe. And there were two separate crowds. So it was hip hop and, and, and Nirvana and Rage Against the Machine and alternative music for the house parties up at home. But when we came to the city, it was dance music. And we were talking pre, pre-show on Friday nights. We'd go to the underground till midnight and then head out to the raves out of, out of NAF Studios. Um, you know, and that was kind of our pattern and, and going out to the parties and how that scene was, oh gosh, 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I know. It goes by fast. Feels like it was yesterday. It does um, feel like it was yesterday though. There's a lot of parties that I just am so surprised they were so long ago. Cause I have such strong memories of certain events, you know, other events, I kind of, you know, everything gets put into one, one memory core, <laughs> <laughs> but there's certain things that, I fully remember them and they're, yeah, they're like 30 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, the landscape has changed and, and seeing the rise and you've been witness to this, seeing the rise of the U S dance music scene. Do you also get to go and tour in Europe and have you watched the differences between the two scenes and are there differences between the two or uh, that you see? Have you, have you noticed the difference between the two? Um, I haven't been back to Europe in four years. So I can't really comment on that right now. You know, I, I definitely have seen a really interesting turnaround in the States and in Canada 
in the last year, you know, just mm-hmm. how everyone's sort of navigating, going back into throwing events. And um, it's been really incredible, you know, especially in the, in the beginning of everyone getting to go back out, you know, you could just see the pure joy of being around people and, really being able to experience something that was taken away for a minute, you know, and, and I still feel that, you know, it will, I'll be, I think more grateful going forward, you know, and not taking it for granted. I mean, not that I did, but I think we all kind of did, you know, you're like, Oh, like, you know, there'll be this party next week or whatever. And then to not go out for such a long period of time kind of changes your perspective. And, and for me, music is, it's so much more just than just about partying, you know, it's like the, the connection we have with one another and how it brings us together and the community. And it's just, it's so much stronger. And I think I see that with a lot of people where they are feeling the community more so than ever. You know, when you mentioned that, I know we were talking, when you mentioned community and feeling it, I think I do remember one time you were playing at Sea Sound Lounge. And I always loved that club because it was such an intimate vibe. You could be so close to the artists. I mean, it was, it was a big, small room, in my opinion. And there was so much that went on there and saw so many great artists. But I remember you're back there and I think you, you were singing. You were singing on a, like a, it was almost like a headset mic. It's a headset think, mic, yeah. It was a headset mic, but I think you were holding it in your hand. I hold it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do I remember like, that. What I are you doing that. with this? Mic? Yeah, and I was like, okay, I, I'm thinking to myself, how is that going to work with the monitor speakers <laughs> in the thing? And that's, I mean, and that's I why just, I use that mic. Yeah, it, it must just have a very small. It's it's really made range. for drummers, you know. It's, oh, okay. It's a mic and it's made for drummers, and it can get feedback, but it rarely does. Okay. Which is why I use that because a lot of times, especially when I first started playing like really big events, you didn't get a sound check. Everything is blasting. And also, you know, like, I like it loud, too. Like, I can't turn it way down and then do a, you know, performance that is inspiring on any level. So I had to find a mic that worked the best. And I don't wear it because it's kind of like I'm (laughs) taking my headphones off and then putting that on. So I just hold it. Yeah. And 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 I'm used used to it now because the few times I've used a proper handheld mic, number one is like, really heavy because <laughs> I'm used to that tiny little mic and um, you know, it just doesn't really get feedback. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and, and speaking about events, you have a really awesome event coming up in Chicago at smart bar yes. with the super Jane <clears throat> group. Tell yes. us, tell our DJ sessions fans about the super Jane group. And I was, I was looking at the line. I'm like, wow, that's, that's awesome. It's super fun. Um, so Super Jane started in Chicago in 97. And um, it's the first time that I ever DJed out in a club was the first Super Jane event. So I'd been a bedroom DJ for a minute. And I was I was already like, you know, throwing parties and I was working on music and singing, but I was very afraid <laughs> to <laughs> DJ in public. And um Heather and um, Dehoda and Lady D and I, um, you know, created this Super Jane party and we're celebrating 25 years. So just like that, you know, it's pretty wild. You know, I I wonder what it's going to be like to have the DJ sessions 25 year anniversary party. I mean, that's just what's weird is it just goes so quickly and you don't really think about it because, you know, you're always thinking about like what you're working on currently or what you're about to work on. And what I do like about these anniversary events is it's a nice moment to just kind of reflect on all of the time that you've spent with, you know, each other and the community that has been around Super Jane. And, you know, Super Jane was one of the first collectives that featured all women in the u.s so it was really impactful for us I met a lot of people throughout the years a lot of women and a lot of men you know who said super jane really inspired them to get mm-hmm. on the decks and and so it's so much bigger than any of us you know mm-hmm. and um i know for me like i didn't see a lot of women playing when i started and i think like 
having a group of women playing, it kind of lets you know, like, okay, there are a lot of women out there doing it. It's not, you know, something that I should be afraid to try myself. Yeah, I, I remember uh, going back to 2017. I went to the Imagine Festival here in in Washington, and they debuted. It only played once before they debuted at this Imagine Festival. It was the um, the documentary called Amplify Her. I hope I got that right. Maybe I'll use. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think it is. It is. It is. Amplify. Hang on. Amplify Her. Yes, the film, Amplify Her. And it was kind of this documentary of, of a number of different female DJs going through what they've gone through and telling their story. It was so well produced. I was blown away by it. And, you know, back in the day, funny enough, I seen all the DJs that would come on the show. It was, it was obviously very male dominated. And one time I, I went out there and I said, hey, you know what I'd like to do? is there's all the, the female DJs around town, trans binary, all, all that. I want more than just guy DJs on the show. And I went out there and put something out on social media about this. And I was literally attacked for trying huh. to put together an all female review um, at that time. I mean, we only have four DJs that would play every show or four DJs. And I was just looking for like four people that are friends of my friends on Facebook that I knew personally saying, Hey, would you like to, would you like to, would you like, to? yeah. And seeing that blowback come, you'd be quite amazed of who the blowback came from. I was kind of appalled. I never went through with it. And then later on, there was a nightclub in town that tried doing the same thing and promoted it as a all female lineup. And they got attacked for doing it. And in this day and age, being as progressive of a city as Seattle supposed to be seeing something that happened, it, it really blew me away. Funny enough, the people that did the attacking went back and they did an all-female show mm. and branded it and put it out there. And it's like, <clears throat> wait a second here. <laughs> you know, it, it's very it was very interesting that that, that happens. And I, even today I got some blowback on a post that I made. Um, and somebody said, Oh, look at these hardworking DJs. You see this in live streaming a lot. And they they got nicknamed the term booby streamer. That okay. the only reason a guy turns in and watches a girl <laughs> on live streams is because she has boobs. Right. If she didn't have boobs, they wouldn't be watching her. And you watch that. I would get in these forums and I would attack. I would go on the war so path. So bizarre. Mean, why are you doing that? Why keep it down? Why Why does that exist in this day and age? Um, you know, and it, it just sucks. But to see that you've had something going on for 25 years to build a legacy to leave on and inspire is so awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the biggest keywords that that I drive for with the DJ sessions is working with, you know, brand new DJs like bedroom DJs that are coming out and never played a gig before to DJs that are opening up the Brooklyn Mirage for lay, lay youth, you know, yeah. and, and having careers and going international is because I want to make sure that there's a legacy left behind. I think that's something really cool to have. And I, I know that throughout your career, like I said, watching you for years, <laughs> literally play and have, you've made an impression upon me and I know that thousands of others have also had that impression made as well. So congratulations oh, on, on keeping that alive for 25 years. That is definitely a, it's a feather in the hat stocking I don't, <laughs> a notch in the belt. I, bigger than that though. I mean, to, like I said, to do something for 25 years is, is really momentous. I was, I was again talking with DJ Ruby uh, earlier and the question was asked, you know, Carl Cox has been DJing. Yeah. Or he's, he just turned 60 July 29th. Which is and incredible. He's 60 years old. And, you know, the question is, is, is there a retirement age for DJs? And the, what Ruby said, the only time I ever see people retiring or leaving the game is because of family. And they want to spend more time with their family. And they kind of, kind of start bowing out a little bit more because family is an obligation. Family takes time and precedence. But, um, you know. Do you see yourself DJing at six? <laughs> yeah, I mean, number one, you can do anything as long as it's bringing you joy and, mm -hmm. you know, is something that you still find inspiration from. Um, I'm a mom. I have two kids, you know, and I spend a lot of time with my children. And so it's not easy. You know, I definitely have help. Cause when I go on the road, I have to have people help me. 
And, um, you know, I'm never bored. <laughs> <laughs> I never have any free time. But um, I love music. You know, when I was three years old, I said, I want to be a singer when I grow up. And, um, you know, I don't think there should be an age limit. Music is for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, there's so much to learn constantly, you know, mm -hmm. from making music, from DJing, and, and it's all relevant. It's all important. You know, people coming up just as important as people who've already been here. And mm -hmm. everyone should kind of give each other that room, you know, give each other that respect and that space. I don't think that um, music has an age limit at all. You know, I look at Stevie Nicks, you know, and she's still performing. I'm going to go see her next month. And she's the reason I wanted to be a singer. So for me to see her performing and she's in her 70s is, is so inspiring to me. And I just, I love music so much. So I can't imagine not doing it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, my dad, I grew up, my dad would fund my brother's punk rock shows. So I grew That's up, awesome. and he, he would be at the <clears throat> punk rock shows and he would take me to concerts, you know, and I, I would go to shows, you know, and stuff. So always, you know, my dad wasn't the old fuddy duddy dad. He was, yeah. the, when I was born, he was listening to Fleetwood Mac and Queen. That sounds cool. When yeah, he was pretty, he's a pretty cool dude, um, you know, but definitely was always lavishing with my brothers at being in a band, uh, you know, uh, gear and, and, and the stuff to help them be in a band. Um, but for me, when it came to like video production, I was always the tech kid. Yeah. You know, and it was like, oh, we got a we got a we got a VCR. Darren, go hook it up. We got a new stereo. Darren, go hook it up. Oh, we got a new cordless phone. OK, you know, you That's tell us cute. how to use all this. The stuff. cordless and phone. I love the it. cordless phone. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it was kind of a complicated thing. Like you didn't. You it know, was. Read, like, no, I mean, you know, it wasn't challenging. It's just funny to hear the cordless phone. I love it. But whatever it was, I always had a passion for technology, which kind of got me into video production at a very early age. And uh, and then later on in the computer video editing and everything of that nature. But, um, you know, it's it's just, I think, always keeping that door open, always looking to grow or always looking to learn, yeah. I think, is one of the <clears throat> bigger things. I'm always constantly learning new stuff or, you know, and, and I used to have a policy where two years ago, two and a half years ago, I would say 98% of the information that I've learned, I would give away freely. Yeah. Because it's probably already out there on the internet in a YouTube video or in a book in a bookstore. You know, those those things that used to exist called bookstores. Right. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, don't even, I think Barnes & Noble has gone under now. There are a few kind of collective bookstores. But that being said, um, education was always been key to my growth. But I did have to dial it back to 97% in 2020 because I realized everyone was knocking on my door trying to become my competitor <laughs> oh yeah and i was like you know there's this wonderful thing i i gotta go back and worry about my own show and you want me to give you free consulting advice on how to set up your own show when technically shouldn't you be working with me on my show to help right my show <clears throat> but everyone i called 2020 the look at me year yeah um, because every other post online was Look at me streaming. Look at me streaming. Look at me streaming. Look at me streaming. It, it was kinda, an intense year for a lot it was, of reasons. It was, pretty, it was pretty crazy. And I kind of took a step back, but I felt good that a lot of people recognized the, the what we had done over here. And that, yeah, people were knocking on my door and asking me questions. Yeah. And I felt more than happy to, of course, get this camera. Of course, use Twitch. Don't use this. Use this. Well, how many years have you guys been doing the show now? This show here, we are going on year 13 in a couple months. Wow. Yeah, with uh, just about 2,400 episodes produced. Uh, it has not been consistent over all those years. There were dips and ups and downs and breaks. It being still counts. Taken. It still counts. It still um, counts. But, but, you know, we just – what we're doing now and having everything dialed in over the last couple years, you know, um, our new plan of attack is really – we were very local-based in the sense of things. We had our following more in the States – now over the last six to eight months, we've really been focusing on getting more of an international base and have a whole 
when you put these things together, people are like, oh, we're just going to go attack it internationally. In one month, we're going to be known around the world. No, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. We've had a slow progression, a rollout, a mythology to what we're doing with building everything up to a big crescendo launch at ADE this year, which we're super excited to be a part That's of. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I know. I've, I mean, I've never been to summer. I went to EDC last year, and you, my friend told me, I've never seen the pavement at EDC. And that just meant that the numbers were, weren't as big as it normally was, because you normally yeah. are, you don't get to see the pavement there. And going to Amsterdam, it's, it said that there's 400,000 people a day in Amsterdam for seven days. I mean, it's a really, I haven't been in a while, but it, it's really incredible. And it's yeah. just, and it's also it's just so, it's such a beautiful place to be in. And then what I've always liked about AD and, you know, Winter Music Conference and anything where you can get everyone kind of together in one place, it's to just have that time together, you know? And, and I think especially as a DJ, it's really important to hear other people play. You know, and there's so many times where you're on tour and, you know, you kind of get to hear people play, but it's different when you're in a different city for like five days yeah. and you really hear people play music. It's so important, you know, because like I said earlier, you never stop learning and I'm still inspired, you know, 30 years in going to hear someone play a set that just took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's I think one of my passions before I started the DJ sessions was I had been going to nightclubs since I was 18, well, technically 16 years old, but I was always that dance floor participant. I've never learned how to DJ in all in 30 years of, of being surrounded by electronic music. I own my own gear, but I own my own gear because we have to produce and put on our own shows. Yeah. But I, I'm always the video technical, social media, networking, handshaking, sponsorship, getting, driving the truck around guy, an interviewer doing all this, that picking up DJ and I'm like, that would take up so much of my time, you know, and I'd rather just dance Sounds and like let maybe, other people. Maybe you might want to try though. <laughs> I could, I could, but what, you know, the one thing that freaked me out was when we first started the show it was 2010 it was and I was interviewing this DJ and I asked him, I said, Hey, how many hours a week do you spend looking for music? And he's like, I spend sometimes an hour to three hours a day. And this is 2010 times, you right. know, not, not nowadays times. Uh, and I was like, I don't have, you know, 10 to 20 hours a week to look for music and then build such a collection of music. Then I got to go through that. And the whole mantra of telling the story with the music, what's going to fit well, I have to practice that and work it yeah. out, get it together, plan the set. And then where am I going to play that set? Yes, I could play on my own show. And there was a show at the time in the beginning called um, – it was Open Table Thursdays. And what I was going to do was the first DJ would play. Then the second part would be instruction of them showing me how to DJ. And then the third part would be me actually DJing. Right. And that was going to be my concept of learning how to DJ through live streaming 10 yeah. years ago on open table Thursdays. And I'd always have a guest DJ coming in and teaching me tips and tricks, which would also be teaching the world tips and tricks right. no, and then watching cool me idea. go through it. Well, they'd play tips and tricks on how to do things. And then I'd play using what they taught me. And that never came to fruition. <laughs> You're like, I don't really want to learn how to DJ live. <laughs> well, yeah. And well, then, you know, what you know. Is, honestly, the best way to learn how to DJ seriously is by yourself. I mean, I taught myself how to DJ and granted it was on, on with records because that's all there was at the time, but I had two copies of the same record. It wasn't a really complicated song and I just practiced bringing them in and out of each other. Oh, you know? Because then they already went together because it was the same record. And, yeah, I guess, um, and for vinyl, that could be a really awesome way to kind of train. I mean, I don't, I've never played vinyl, but I, I know the difficulties. Playing. It just There's made no it easier. Button. That's just how, <laughs> yeah, like you got to like, it's all your, it's all hand ear coordination. Yep. And, um, and it would, I would, I would say that it would actually be an easy way to learn initially how to just beat match. Cause I still think that's really relevant. I know that the, yeah auto sync button exists. Um, I don't use it, but it's so much fun to DJ. I'm like, why would you not want to just learn how to DJ? It's super fun. Yeah. And, and I mean, 
I, what I, I'm always surrounded by, that's another thing is I'm always surrounded by electronic music, doing multiple shows and listening to exclusive mixes that I'm like, can I take a break from electronic music for a minute? And that's when I get to play my down tempo ambient by Soma FM. I try to give them a shout out when I can. Well, maybe you um, could become like solid. a down tempo DJ. You know, I thought about that too. And I heard that can be really hard because it's always, they're always off. They're not, they're like really, it's not like, oh, it's all 124 or one. Well, that's, that's more about cutting as opposed yeah. to beat matching. It's a different and, style, but I don't know. I, I, I think <clears throat> it doesn't really have to be that challenging. You know, you just take little bites out of it, you know? So you don't have to be like, okay, I have to listen to, listen to music three hours a day. No, you don't. Maybe you spend one hour out of the week and you really listen through a bunch of stuff and you find 10 records that you like, you know, realistically, let's say you find 10 records that you like, you're not going to play those 10 records. You're going to play four of them. You know what I mean? So that's why like some people are spending so much time because then when you get them or when you're playing at home and then you're playing in a club, it doesn't always work you know, certain records. So that's why you're practicing at home, but you just do little, you know, little bites at a time. You don't need to um, suddenly make it this big project, you know, of like all my time is devoted to it. Cause you really want to focus on what music do I like? What, what am I really putting out into the world? What kind of blends do I want to do? You know, like, do I want to do blends where I'm like really, being seamless and making them really artistic and musical, this journey that's really smooth, or am I like <clears throat> slamming records in and it's, you know, really intense and I'm cutting back and, you know what I mean? There's just so many ways to DJ and they're all fun, but you don't have to, I don't know. For me, I just think like, if you just take little, like I found 10 records I really like, I'm going to learn how to play these 10 records. That's all you need to start with. And, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I bet you every single one of my DJs that have ever played, any of the DJs that have ever played in the back of our mobile studio would definitely say, Darren, you don't know how hard it is. Why don't you get back here and try this out? <laughs> we're driving around the streets of Seattle with a concert grade sound system and the music's going boom, boom, boom. And they do a phenomenal job, you know, but I'm like, no, I got to drive the truck. No, I'm not going to get back there, DJ. It's like. You know, although there is a funny joke on our site, okay, I guess I do have to confess, I am actually a DJ on our <laughs> website. Okay. Um, there was an incident where I had to actually kind of pinch hit. Uh, we were doing an event, and I got up and I said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make this. I, I'm not a DJ, but I play one on a live stream. And so I got up there and I grabbed a couple mixes and my whole shtick was, I'm going to find mixes that I like and then I'm going to play those mixes, but I'm going to give credit to the DJs who made those mixes, but I'm pressing the play button to make those mixes play. And then I'm up right. on stage performing <laughs> while that mix is playing. You're the selector. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, all right, cool. So now I'm actually, I'm, my actual DJ name is the DJ dot, dot, dot sessions. <laughs> I like it. So See, there um, you go. money stuff. Um, there's been a, a question that I actually had that one of our guests asked. And um, let me see if I can get it. Let me find it right here. It's not in our chat room. It's in the Twitch chat room. But it is. Um, did it did it did it. Did it. And I, I, it went by because there's so many questions going by. Um, did it, did it, did it. What is what do you consider the biggest break that launched your DJ career? Wow. Um. That's a really tough one, you know, because there are just so many little things that happened. Um, when I when I first started DJing, I had already just come out of being a promoter. So I was sure. promoting a bunch of nights in Chicago for, I guess, like three or four years before I started DJing. And I was releasing music, so I don't know. Maybe like the... That's a really tough one because it's, it's like little things that kept happening, you know, like mm -hmm. Super Jane launched and that was a really big deal um, for me. And then I had um, a CD come out, a mixed CD come out with After Hours called In the Sun. So that was probably my first um, proper mixed CD. You know, I had I had done a bunch of mixtapes, but 
I, you know, those were essentially bootlegs because <laughs> you just made a mixtape. You're like, I made a mixtape. Um, and then in the, the summer of 2000, Super Jane did our first big inter, uh, tour in the States. And that was, I had been touring a lot already, like in the Midwest and then a couple of things around the U.S., but that was the first time we did a huge tour all over. So that could, that could have been one of the first big things for me, you know. But I think the main thing is, is that, you know, you just constantly are always working. You know, when I, when I first started DJing, I was working in um, I was working at Gramophone Records, I was throwing parties. I was also um, working at After Hours at the label. And, um, and I was playing everywhere, you know, I'd play at restaurants. So I was like, great, I'll play for five hours for 50 bucks. Fantastic. You know, so it was just the nonstop hustle and all mm-hmm. those things is, is really what made it happen. Not really one thing. And do you handle your own promotion now, or do you have a team that you work with that handles that? So... I have an agent. I've been working with um, NECA from Apt Entertainment for a long time. Over the years, you know, I've had publicists for different projects. Um, different managers have been on uh, quite a few labels. Um, I was on Ohm Records for a long time, which was also that was like a really big thing for me. You know, getting signed to Ohm in 2004 and they released my debut artist album. That was a huge moment for me especially mm-hmm. as just as an artist, you know, that was something that had been a goal of mine my, since I was a kid, you know, to have an album with mm-hmm. original music and um, just so many things, you know. So I, I definitely do all my own social media. I don't have anyone else do it because I feel like that isn't the way I want to put myself out there. I always want it to just be me, you know, authentically me on the interwebs and how important is social media to you i find that it's important because it's how we connect with one another now you know it's how you promote um shows when i was a promoter in 1995 i went out to clubs (laughs) six (laughs) months a week passing out flyers and Mm -hmm. um that's not how it is now, which I'm also kind of grateful for because I can't really be in nightclubs six nights a week. Um, so it's just, you know, it's how we connect with one another. And I, I think it's good to have like a nice combination of like talking about music and shows and then also having some more lighthearted silliness or even just talking about other music that you like that has nothing to do with you, you know, because I think we can't just make it be a promotional tool it has to be a little bit of everything you know and it's also okay to take breaks like i didn't post on instagram for four days you know four days four days i'm messing my algorithm you know i'm in i'm in trouble now but it's fine because i didn't feel like it (laughs) uh no we're getting we, we just had to go back and revamp our complete social media strategy and get all the tools dialed in to do this um, and I try to explain, you know, this over the years that I've heard this rule is that it should be an 80, 20 rule. Okay. You know, it, it should be 20% business stuff and 80% something that people are going to want to engage with or find engaging like, Oh, look, I ate this omelet today or, <laughs> Oh, look, I, I found this dress or, okay, now check out my label, check out my album I released. Okay. You know, that's kind of the safe ratio. And I don't know if that ratio still exists to this day, especially with things like TikTok coming into play. Kind of that's right. a whole new beast that I'm still trying to th- I'm pretty I've bad figured at TikTok. It out. I put up like four videos. I'm like, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, well, I'm a big foodie. And the only thing I've been able to really spend time on and making those videos is when I'm cooking in the kitchen. Yeah. But you have to make like a little video or take a picture of each step of what you're doing. Yeah, so you're going to burn it, burning that food. Like, <laughs> I'm actually You're really like, good in the kitchen. I made this great video and I messed up my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> no, I well, I I just wouldn't post it. <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, no, actually, so- I probably would post it so it'd go viral and look like this is why you don't TikTok when you cook. Yeah, you just post the Hashtag- plate where it's all eaten. I forgot to take the picture. That's my favorite. Like it was so good. 
you know, I've actually done that before. I'm like, <laughs> and I took and I took the first three bites, and I'm like, I can't take a picture of this. <laughs> yeah, um, but no, huge food. But I, I think TikTok is a very interesting platform. And I mean, when I, I talk with people, funny. I think people are hilarious on it. I just, <clears throat> you know, I like to be goofy in private. I'm not ready to be goofy in public. You know. What has been the nicest thing a fan has ever said to you in person? Oh my gosh. I've been really lucky. People are, have always been so generous with me and have shared really just amazing stories. I, I think for me, some of the, the things I'm most grateful for is how music has touched different people. And, you know, a lot of people have shared with me how, different songs or albums have really helped them and in, in times that were challenging for them. And, you know, that just, uh, that makes me really, really happy. And, and also that someone would share that with me. That's just really amazing. I think it was, um, when our first year of the show, and I, I'll give you an experience that can relate directly to that. We had our studios down in Pioneer square and we're doing a show. And I believe Darude was there with us in the studio. And um, somebody who was a tenant who was walking by who had a studio down the hallway from us was working with a producer who we later became friends with. We all became friends, was walking by and she goes, walks through the door and she looks in the studio door because the, the studio is literally, literally probably 92 degrees at all times. Oh, my like gosh. We had big fans <laughs> going on. Like, cause, well, back then we were using total lights. So I had like two 750 yeah, lights, watts lights, lights and yeah. lighting up and had fans. But we had the studio door, but she walks by and she's like, Oh my God, that's, that's Darude in the studio. And she kind of sat there and watched the whole show. And later on we were talking and, and, and she goes, she, she let that the story to him and says, I just want to let you know your music saved my life. Now I was at a point where I was literally on a deep bender going down that road and I was laying in this hotel room and your song came on and it brought me back out of it. And it, I just want to let you know. And hearing that and just having that kind of serendipitous moment, she didn't know he was in the studio. Didn't even yeah. know who we were and walking by and runs into him and gets to share that experience. I think that's really awesome when fans can connect with their artists on a level, especially if the artist takes time to, after the show, spend time talking with the fans. Yeah. You know, um, you know, some, some artists are, they got to go, they got to catch that next plane. I get it. Um, some get to stay all night. Um, you know, it, or a nightclub, I know that they, they usually have an artist meet and greet at the end of the show uh, with what they're doing there, which is awesome. But um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it was always a joy for me. Uh, we don't get many in-person fans because we're either driving a truck around or we're in a studio, we're on location. Right. But when people do come up and say, what you're doing is so amazing and, and, and I, I want to come back and I want to be a part of this again and again. Um, I think it's one of the biggest compliments out there. So that's awesome. That is. And you um, know, everyone, everyone needs each other. You know, I mean, I'm always mm -hmm. so grateful when people come to play and they're like, Oh, thank you for coming. I'm like, thank you for coming, you know, because mm -hmm. I can't play if no one's there, you know, like everyone is just as important, you know, mm -hmm. we're all there to be, to experience something together, you know? So I'm, I'm always really grateful and happy that I get to play music. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, Always, always a joy. You, you said that your life outside of music is pretty busy. How do you spend the days in between the different tour dates that you're doing or producing? What, what does a day in the life of Colette look like outside of this thing called music? Well, I have two children. So <laughs> especially right now, it's summertime. So, you know, my children are like, what's up? So, you know, we will go on little random excursions, you know, we'll go to the ocean and we'll go hiking and um, they're just super funny. You know, like my daughter is six and she always wants to come to shows with me. And she's like, she even told me recently, she's like, I'll just stand behind you. She's like, they won't even see me. And I was like, no one's going to notice a little person standing behind me, little six year old child. Um but um, it's just, it's nonstop, you know? So I'm always just trying to balance everything. And sometimes I'm successful at it and sometimes I'm not, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge. And um, I, 
never really enjoyed flying, but now I kind of like it because it's the only time I have where my day is still, you know, and I can breathe and no one's asking me for a snack. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, sometimes I try to work on some music on the plane as well. <clears throat> Not the easiest. I know a lot of people will do it, but sometimes I can kind of do it. And, but it's also bizarre because they're, there's a stranger right next to you and you're like, eh. I'm writing my opus and you're right next to me. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's nonstop. It really is. Mm -hmm. And do you, do you, how are the question I guess is, did it, did it, did it, did it, where do you find your free time to stay fit? Um, I go on a two hour walk every day awesome. and, um, I use that time actually to do my business phone calls. So I am still doing two things at the same time, but that's what I do. You know, the, the reason and, I ask that question is because, you know, music is kind of producing music. is kind of synonymous with spending a lot of time behind the desk, sitting down, doing that work. And, you know, yeah, when I'm in the studio, to, I'm not, you know, my, my activity level goes down. So when I'm in the booth recording, I try to like, I mean, I always dance when I'm singing. So I have like a little movement, but yeah, on my full studio days, cause when I do a, a recording day, I'm in the studio for like 10 hours. Um, I try to take at least one 20 minute walk in the middle of the day. And mm -hmm. then I try to like do my dance moves, my dance routine <laughs> while I'm singing. But it's, you, actually, you, you have to make the time, you know. Do you actually you actually choreograph your dance routines, or is this something just kind of no, like, no, no? Oh. I'm, I'm not a great dancer. I'm an oh, I'm a like okay dancer. You know, I'm not bad, but like I'm not good. <laughs> <clears throat> and jumping into back to technology a little bit here, have you done anything into, or are you looking to do anything in virtual reality? I. M and I um, will be announcing all that very very soon. So I'm I'm excited. I can't announce it just yet, but very soon in the next um, couple weeks, I'm awesome. going to be doing more things virtually. Awesome. Um, yeah, we just launched um, two nightclubs in Alt Space, and they're in. Um, they, we've soft opened them, and we're getting ready to grand open them. And and what we can do in there is there's just much more than. Do you own an Oculus or do you own a 3D device or any? Is there one I in the don't. household? I don't. Oh, it's okay. You can go watch it from the computer <laughs> screen and watch it in 2D. It's all good. They're pretty impressive clubs. We call them entry and beta. And, you know, we plan to have, do have a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, record release parties, meet and greets, uh, exclusive mixes, um, you know, pay-per-view shows, lots of awesome stuff. You know, I have that conversation nice. with a lot of people because – you know, both you and I have been around kind of that pre, I don't want to say pre-internet, but almost pre-website for artist days. You know, it was yeah. dot .com, you know, in the early, <laughs> in the mid nineties, you know, you started hearing dot .com come out, but a lot of artists they, who got a website and who had a website in 1999, 2000, not a I lot did. of people. You did? I did. All yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I got, I had a website in, I think in like 98. 98. Yeah. Yeah. That would I be did. right around the time some artists yeah. would, would have been dabbling into that. But, you know, a lot of businesses would say like brick and mortars would say, I don't need a website. I have customers that come in. I don't need an right. online. Presence. Yeah. No, no, no. And I then mean, go back and look at what companies like Nordstrom's and Amazon did, right. you know, and, and all that dot com boom. And then set the way forward clock to 2005. -ish. Well, three, four, five issue, you know, MySpace was coming out and everyone had a MySpace. Is that when it came out? I don't even remember. Somewhere right. Yeah, it had to be then because I know I was started Facebook working for Facebook was Apple. what, 2008, right? No, no. Facebook, well, Facebook, no. Facebook publicly was around 2005 because, okay. well, it was even a little bit before, I think three or four. And, but they only targeted, you could only get on if you had a corporate email, like if you were oh. for IBM.com or Apple.com, or if you have a college and EDU email. Right. And then they finally went, boop, we're opening to the world now. And yeah. everyone can get a Facebook account. And I remember Facebook coming into play. Everyone had MySpaces because they would come into the Apple store. Yeah. When I was working for Apple. And they would check their MySpace account while they were at the mall. Because the Apple store literally became kind of the new video game arcade. 
You oh, know, crazy. It, we would yeah. say, you know, if you went to the if you went to the mall, if we went to Bell Square where I work, you went to Bell Square to go shop and get what you were going to get and stop by the Apple store or you came by the Apple store and then maybe went and walked around to look at what you would never buy. Yeah. But everyone stopped by the Apple store to see the new and improved products. But while they were there, the kids would come in and instead of popping quarters into a video game machine, they'd be jumping on their MySpace. <laughs> and at one time they actually shut down MySpace on all the computers in the store. And I had a little bit of beef with that because I'm like, here you are century in a platform when we're supposed to demo to a customer how they can use Safari as an awesome browser to access their, oh, yeah. sorry, can't go to MySpace because it's locked out. Well, there's too many people using it. And I'd say, well, then ask them to move. Ask them to stop. We need this computer for a demo. Just yeah. ask the customer to leave the store in a polite way. Oh, customer that's crazy. service them. Oh, it was, I yeah, I was not, they, were, they ended up unreleasing it. But then right around that time, Facebook, I think I set up a Facebook account in 2006, but I don't think I touched it till 2009. Yeah, I don't remember really, really getting on it. Facebook until like 2008. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was it was a slow progression uh, at that time, and and then Twitter was right around the edge, right around there as well. Yeah. It was kind of like I didn't I didn't get Twitter and how powerful Twitter was with the use of that one word hashtag. Right. You know, if you understood how to use hashtags back then, but Facebook users did not get Twitter, and Twitter users were like. <laughs> Wow, Facebook sucks. You know, <laughs> then Instagram came out and got bought by Facebook and now TikTok's out and it's now that social media thing. But VR is kind of like I said, the new I'm talking to a lot of people and, and asking that question, are you looking at doing in something in VR? Yeah, no, I, I am and I'll be doing about six I think six sets a year. Nice. In a virtual space. Nice, nice, nice. Yes, so yeah. It's I I'm gonna be talking about it more in the next coming weeks. So I'm okay. excited about it. It's definitely different for me, you know. Um, I think it will be super cool. Mm -hmm. Well, it, the, the different, the difficult thing about VR that I found out when I first started getting into it. I mean, once I first got my headset last year, it was almost immediate that my friend and I started having conversations about making a nightclub in VR, and yeah. I think that was April last year, and then it all of a sudden became. August, September. And that's when I started researching and, and was talking to devs about building my first nightclub build. And I found this really awesome build, but it's not like deploying a website. Right. Like, if you know, if you know anything about website development, you know, you get a server, you got your code. Typically a server is a server, no matter where you go, your code is your code. You can plug it in. You can copy and paste that code and put it on other servers. Okay. It doesn't work that way in VR. <laughs> you got to build for if you build for all space, it's built for all space. If you're building for Horizons or VR Chat or uh, Solarium or Decentraland, it's all different. Like I had a place that approached me and they wanted to get our content in their nightclub space in Decentraland, and I say, well, how much does it cost to buy a plot of land? Because Decentraland is basically all um, uh, crypto crypto based, right? And they're like, how much does a plot of land cost in in Decentraland? Like uh, about twenty five hundred bucks. And that when I say plot of land, I'm talking about a small little square. Mm -hmm. And they went and took a look at my club, and they're like, "Darren, this would cost you probably about forty to fifty thousand dollars to buy the land to put this build in Decentraland." I'm like, "Okay, so I guess we're not launching there anytime soon." Right. Um, but but having that op ability to, uh, I don't know if you remember something called Second Life back in the day. I don't. It was um it was a sandbox. It was 3D. It was a 3D environment. Think of The Sims, only whatever you created, you owned. And it okay. was a complete sandbox environment. I got the Yamas. Yama. <laughs> Yamas doing the yamming. Okay. Yes, pet. I already gave you greenies. I love doing live shows. Anything can happen. Um, especially the cats. They Your love cat's it, like, too. It's done. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> okay, fine. Come here, fluffy head. Fine. Now you're a, now you're a star. Hi. Hey, look at you. <laughs> and so how um, cute are you? Yeah. He's he's one of the one of the two fluffies that are around here. He's uh, very cute. Thank you. And um I'm cat sitting actually. They're my friend's cats. And so I love the yamas though. Mm, yes, that's what you Aww. wanted. You wanted pets and hugs. But um Second I Life love was cats, a cats, they don't care. 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm surprised he hasn't jumped up here and gone right across the screen yet. But um, no, Second Life was kind of like a 3D environment. You could build what you build. You could keep. There was an internal currency. It was really awesome. And it was like virtual reality without being able to get in there in a 3D sense. There weren't you didn't have Oculus. You didn't have a way to do that. Yeah. And now moving forward, we've always wanted to put our brand in there and make it like a Starbucks and have it all over the place of the DJ sessions all over the place. And now we're actually doing that through VR with, uh, we started with alt space, which is kind of a really creative space. We'll be doing VR chat deployment next. Cool. But yeah, really excited about the possibilities and then AR as well. Uh, what's going on with augmented reality. Cause you know, Facebook has their project coming out. Apple has their augmented reality glasses coming out. So how that's going to change the concept of the physical environment with augmented reality. Cause you could be at a show. Then all of a sudden be looking at the ceiling and go, I want to switch that to look and make it look like the Milky way. And, and yeah. now the whole club is like a Milky way environment, all virtual and mapped or there's creatures running around and flying through the air and you could interact with those things yeah. going on during well, that's your song what man did last year right didn't they have... i didn't see what they did i know they did a big drone thing i thought but i don't know if no, it they had it with, through huge Oculus. augmented reality I'm, yeah oh you mean oh you mean the burning man online the yeah. burning man in vr yes yes they did that they did that and it was it was cool it was very interesting um well, my friend bought tickets for it right away and i think you got like you could buy 25 bucks a day or something and get in there and, and do that but the augmented reality experience, you know, being on site at an event because virtual reality will so not. You're still, so you're still in the club with the. You could go to the club the, and just put your glasses on, not the big headset. Okay. This would be like this would be like me going like this. I wish they were this small, but I could go like this and. So you I'm still see perform. what's actually in front mm -hmm. of you. Yeah, and so you could be sitting there, and all of a sudden, let's say you drop a track, and I'm wearing my glass at the club. All of a sudden, that track pops up and says buy now and it's rotating above your head or right at the booth you pop up, <laughs> buy this track or your actual set list of what you're playing no more shazam I mean, you could just be playing right there oh that's crazy and you could have a whole different visual backdrop behind you and i could change that experience around to what i want it to be and see and again like i said i could have pikachu running around the club if i wanted to or or creatures or different visual art. Like if I had artwork on the wall, yeah. I could have so interactive So it's everything artwork. that they've already set up before people get in there. That Correct. With the glasses. I got Yeah, you. exactly. And then if you have that, you could turn it on and be doing all that. It's going to be <laughs> wild. The next, the next three to five years, what, like I said, with Facebook's, I mean, I already see people here. kind of doing that without glasses. <laughs> yeah. We're really excited about the technology because we do silent concerts, silent disco events. Yeah. And so being able, when somebody would be on the red channel, they could have a red augmented reality, yeah. but then they switch to the blue channel and they could have a blue channel augmented reality. And we have seven channels to play with, the only ones in the world. So imagine having seven stages, but we don't have to do lighting and production and all this crazy stuff for them because in augmented reality, they could just choose which stage they want to look at and listen That's to through crazy. the headsets. Yeah, I could go down the rabbit hole on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyways, one last question or a couple last questions before we let you get going here. If someone were to write a biography about you, what do you think the title should be? Oh, my gosh. That's such a challenging one. Um, the title of a, bi of a biography about me. Um, I don't know. <laughs> like, um girl from chicago i don't know girl from chicago all right we'll take that girl from chicago is she gonna be on bookshelves in a year or two sure yeah <laughs> i'm ready i'm ready for my my life story to be out there <laughs> I, i've always talked about over the last i wasn't 30 years ago i think it was the early 2000s after my first real stint of, of kind of hanging out in the nightclub scene um kind of with the upper echelon, you know, because you, you kind of go to a club. I have a whole theory about A level, B level, C level, D level, and E level. And that's my category oh, wow. of who hangs out in the clubs. And, you know, your A levels are like your top promoters, the people of the who's to, they're yeah. usually on the guest list. The B levels are the kind of newcomers who are trying to be friends and get on that guest list. The C levels are just your kind of everyday people. Your D levels are people that are just like randoms. They just never would... Maybe they just pop in and then your E-levels are people that are like tourists. They aren't from here, but they're still at your club. And that hierarchy of the system. And then 
I think the book's going to be called How to Work a Nightclub and Get Away with It. <laughs> <laughs> because it'll give tips and tricks on, you know, if you want to climb this upper echelon, how you go about doing it. And right. um, you could apply this theory to a lot of different places around the world, unless they have really good security, because that's the first rule is <laughs> make friends with your security. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a whole little pattern that I saw that after time I saw this going through. And if you if you follow these actions, it worked without fail every single time. Um, but, you know, that's another story. I've been talking about that book You're for like, that's a book. years. <laughs> yeah. So, it's a lot um, of stories. Oh, I do want to bring in uh, one last thing, though. You have Coco and Friends coming up on September yes. 25th. Tell us about that show before we let you go. So I started this party, Coco and Friends. Actually, I started it almost 10 years ago now that I think about it. And it's an event that I've been doing mainly in L.A. and sometimes in Chicago where um, I invite my friends to come and do these parties with me. I've, you know, been... DJing a long time and I have a lot of friends who are DJs. So uh, I did a summer series at the W Hollywood in LA and our last one is coming up. It's a daytime event. It's on Sunday, September 25th and it's Doc Martin, Scott K, Dehoda from Super Jane and myself. So it's going to be a really fun way to end this series that we did and then i'll do some more cocos and friends and other places coming up awesome well congratulations on that as well always busy always having something new coming out and congratulations on such a successful career we are gonna definitely be staying in touch with you following up with you as the tradition happens to be on the dj sessions we always want to know what you're up to and what's going on and on that note is there anything else you want to let our dj sessions fans know about you know, I'm just always excited to be here and get to connect with everybody. And, you know, if you ever want to say hello to me at a show, please do or say hi to me online. It's really me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really the one working it. And, you know, I'm just I'm grateful to be here. Thanks again for having me. You know, I, I find that is a very amazing point that you make there because I have a my guy helps me with my social media assistant. But I do give him all the programming of what's supposed to be created and then say, yeah. go out there. And then I proof it all and say, let's go. But that's like a full time, that'd be a full time <laughs> job in itself, especially well, when you have so many four things. Days, you know? But yeah. <laughs> Sometimes um, I, I don't, think there was, I don't, I don't be on there. There was the Twitch streamer, a uh, big, big gaming streamer. I think she wanted to take a break. She took a break for four days of streaming and they penalized her. I think for two weeks or 30 days or something like oh that. My she's, a ma she's a major, major money bringer streamer though. And she said, I'm taking four days for a mental health break. You can't not. No, no. That's you insane. And the, no yeah, they were like forced to be online like that. Yeah. You know, cause sometimes you do need a break. Yeah. You just do. Yeah. And, th and that's okay. It's you know? happened. Um, From anything. Sometimes you just need a break. Yeah. And if you need a day to be like, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. That's okay. Because sometimes you know, you need to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. The burnout can, can bring you down. And I've been there before and had to climb back up out of it. And, yeah. You know. Even if you just take an hour, be like, you know what? I'm going to do nothing for the next hour. I'm not going to look at my phone. I'm just going to go, you know, I, I go some grass it. to sit on and look at the sky for 10 minutes. Sometimes you need to do that. You I usually go make, you really like, I usually go make breakfast or lunch and then binge watch for an hour or two and take a siesta. <laughs> but you know, you need these little, you need little moments to just Absolutely. be by yourself. I think that's, you know, mental health is something that, you know, so many of us have neglected for such a long time. And it's definitely come up more in conversations, you know, especially even in the music world. And it's really important because like you said, burnout is real. And, you know, especially if you want to keep doing this for so long, your physical and mental health is important. Well, and one of the best pieces of advice I heard uh, years ago, there was a gentleman, it wasn't a Ted talk, but he's on stage. He says, you know what? Take this and don't leave it next to your bed. Leave it out in the living room, turn it on silent, put it on do not disturbs and buy yourself an alarm clock to use. Don't use your mobile device as an alarm clock. Cause then right. you're tempted to pick it up. And now you're doing this, or if the middle of the night, you'll pick it up and you start scrolling. And then that blue light 
yeah. should have it on night light. That blue light triggers our brains to wake up and now you're not getting any sleep. Yeah. I have it on the night, the night vision night. actually all day. The orange. Yeah. 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 It definitely does less of an impact. I had a friend of mine tell me that uh, he has, he wears whenever he's on the computer. Now he wears the blue blocker glasses right? and he goes, my eyesight is improved. I get better yeah. sleep. I'm not drained all day. Looking at screen. I got to go get me some of those. <laughs> Show me a whole website. They're actually pretty fashionable too at the website he sent me. Yeah. But they're not sponsoring me, so I'm not giving them a plug. <laughs> well, we'll we'll tell them what's up. Yeah, we'll, we'll tell them, them what's up. You up. All right, Colette, where can people find out more information about you? Where's the best place to go? Um, they can go check me out on Instagram. DJ Colette okay. is there. I am there. I am somewhere. And uh, yeah, say hello. Awesome. And you'll, they'll get the real you. That be, that's me. <laughs> awesome. Colette, thank you so much for coming on the DJ sessions. Always a pleasure having you. And we will be following up with you later in the year, actually for the rest of the years. Till you yeah. tell us to stop following up with you. Don't talk to me ever again. Yeah. I'll be, <laughs> we'll, we'll, be we'll, we'll do it again. And when it's you're here so in Seattle, I'd love, you. yeah. When you're here in Seattle next, let us know. I'd love to get you in the mobile studio and get you out and about town on that. It's a, it's a fun, fun thing to, to do i will i think i'm gonna be coming to seattle pretty soon so i'll let you know okay. as soon as awesome. I am. awesome thank you so much again for coming on the series thank you you're welcome on that note don't forget to go to our website the dj sessions.com find us on tiktok instagram twitter twitch meta wherever but the best place to go is the dj sessions.com there's over 600 news stories every month published. We have our live interview series where you can jump in, chat in the chat room, be part of the show. We have exclusive mixes from DJs and more on the DJSessions.com and find us on Roku, Amazon Fire, and Google Play, and soon to be Apple TV and our VR worlds on Allspace and our mobile app on the App Store and Google Store. This is Darren coming to you from the virtual studios in Seattle, Washington. That's Colette coming in from LA for the virtual sessions. And remember, on the DJ sessions, the music never stops. <laughs>